Let's begin with our next pioneer that we're covering in our series of 27 pioneers. We're looking now at uh, pioneer number 12, uh, our first lady, Rachel Preston, the one, one that we're going to be doing. Oh, there it is. I thought her, she had a beard. Her, her picture that is here. Color looked like a beard. <laughs> this is actually uh, obviously a drawing of her rather than a photograph. And I think this is a drawing as well, the one we have of Litch. You know, Litch uh, looks like a tobacco chewer with the red lips. Really? Yeah, could have, could have been. Rachel Preston, very interesting lady. The, art, the uh, issue that we have on her, volume four, number one of Lest We Forget. Um, lead article entitled The Third Angel's Message, actually written by Dr. Domsteed, um, and subtitled The Sabbath and the Advent Experience, because we're going to find with this lady, we're now introduced in a very, very strong way she was the seventh day Baptist. to the Sabbath, yes, yes. So let's turn to her, um, to the handout that we have on her and consider these events here. She was born in 1809 in Vernon, Vermont, with the name Rachel Delight Harris. We don't know for sure the dates of some of the uh, falling events, but it, she married early. And of court, according to the date we have here, if that's true, she married at age 15, which was not uncommon uh, back in those days. And that would have been 1824, uh, to an Am Amory Oaks. Um, so she was then Rachel Oaks, right? Uh, approximately the next year, which would be, again, she would be in her teen years still, she had her daughter that she named after her middle name, a daughter named Delight. At the age of 17, uh, a date that we know a little bit more certainly, uh, she was converted in 1826 and soon afterwards became a Methodist. She moved with her husband to a town called Verona, New York. By the way, you can go to Google Maps and find a lot of these places. Uh, even though you look at the map and there's no name there, it seems like they know historically where some of these places were. Um, there may not be not much that left there, maybe, maybe then a crossroad or something. In 1837, at the age of 28, she became interested in the Seventh-day Sabbath and began to study it, okay? Despite the opposition of her husband and the Methodist minister where she lived, she accepted the Sabbath and began keeping it, and she joined the Seventh-day Baptist Church in Vernon, New York. And I checked the map, and Vernon is about nine miles or so from Verona. I thought at first maybe there was a misspelling and they were actually the same place, but apparently there are two different locations there. In 1843, her daughter, Delight, when Rachel was 34, her daughter accepted a teaching position at a place called Washington, New Hampshire. We've heard of that when we were looking at whose story? Farnsworth, because that's where he was living, remember? So now the, th the threads are crossing, they're getting tied together, more, more ways than one. According to, uh, it's not in our, our article here, the details are not, other than it mentions later on that her daughter is Delight Farnsworth. I asked Colleen if she knew anything about it. She said yes, she married Cyrus Farnsworth, the younger brother of William. So they're actually the threads are getting tied, right? <laughs> um, she married him June 1847, sometime obviously uh, later, and she joined the Sabbath Keeping Adventists. Delight joined them probably before her marriage even, I would imagine, uh, because when did, when did uh, William and Frederick Wheeler confront the Sabbath, do you remember? 1844, Frederick Wheeler. And New Year, by New Year's of 45, William's son said he was keeping the Sabbath. Okay, so it's very likely that she was keeping it before she, her marriage in 47 even. In 1844, this, again, we're back to Rachel, not her daughter. Rachel, uh, we moved to Washington, New Hampshire, and she was now a widow. Okay? Now, if you look at the history, sometimes they don't always agree. And I, the footnote will tell you that. Other history actually says that she moved there earlier, and she moved there with her husband. 
But anyway, there was at some point she became a widow. And it was while she was attending the Washington, New Hampshire Christian Church, the one that Farnsworth and his group built, remember this part of the story, she confronted the visiting minister, Frederick Wheeler, who had, had admonished the congregation of Advent believers during a communion service. Get this picture. He's there visiting. He's actually a Methodist, but he's an Adventist. Does that make sense? Believes in the second coming of Christ. And he's having a communion service for these, this small group of Advent believers in this church that they had built a few years earlier. And he's admonishing them during the communion service to keep all the Ten Commandments. How did, what did Rachel have to say about that? Here are her words according to the, the history that we have. She says to Frederick Wheeler, I want to tell you that you had better set that communion table back and put the cloth over it until you begin to keep the commandments of God. You yourself constantly break one of them. You observe the Pope Sunday instead of the Lord's Sabbath. What impact did that have on Wheeler? He went home and studied. And by March, he was convicted of the Sabbath and began preaching it. So, here's the impact. This woman, she studied it on her own in New York, became convinced, I'm going to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. We don't know exactly what started her. Maybe she's just reading the Ten Commandments. A lot of, lot of children in Sunday school read the Ten Commandments on the wall, and they say to the Sunday school teacher, why don't we keep the Seventh Commandment, uh, the Fourth Commandment? Why don't we observe the Seventh day? And we don't know exactly how she did it, but she started that train of events. Seventh-day Baptists helped her along, apparently, at least in fellowship, if not in study. Um, in fact, I, I do think uh, there is some record that she did, um, she did have some help from the Seventh-day Baptist. But the event... Next in our history was her moving to Washington, New Hampshire, connecting with Frederick Wheeler, and obviously with William Farnsworth, and uh, passes the Sabbath on to them. Okay? By March, as we said, Wheeler is preaching about it, and in Washington, New Hampshire, she meets and marries her second husband, Nathan Preston. So that's why she goes... Uh, uh, at times we see the, the, the name Rachel Oaks Preston. She's got both of her married names there in her name. And later they move <clears throat> to Vernon, Vermont, her birthplace. Okay, So Vermont to New York to New Hampshire, back to Vermont. In 1855, September of 1855, we're 11 years later now. We're going to run ahead a bit here, then we're going we're to um, do some other things with uh, the Sabbath truth that she was instrumental in bringing to the Advent believers in New Hampshire. She's 46 years old, and Frederick Wheeler has apparently written to a new periodical that's just been published for the last five years. It's called the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, <laughs> being published by James White. And he writes to them saying, have you had any correspondence from Rachel Preston? And in those years, the review answered letters by publishing it in the review. For usually just a brief comment, you know. And so in the September 18 review of 1855, there's a response to Frederick Wheeler. And what is the response? Here it is. It's in the business column. Business is the business of correspondence, we could say. This is what it's right there. F. Wheeler, colon. <coughs> We have not received any letter from Rachel Preston. <laughs> so that's the only comment I could find in the, in the review about Rachel Preston. Um, in the obituary that was written about her, and you can look at this footnote, footnote number four, by S.N. Haskell in the Review and Herald, March 3, 1863. Um, I'm sorry, that should be 18. 68. That's a typo. Um, this is the comment that he, Brother Haskell made in collecting uh, information on Rachel um, in her time back in Vermont. 
hearing much said against brother and sister White at different times by individuals who were disaffected in consequence of reproof which they needed and who sought to relieve their minds by poisoning others, she became cold in religion and prejudiced to some extent against the testimonies, having never seen brother and sister White. Again, picture the, picture the process. These are Advent believers. They're exposed to the <clears throat> Sabbath truth by Rachel's effort in New Hampshire before the passing of the time, right? Frederick Wheeler accepts the Sabbath before October of 44. William Farnsworth accepts it New Year's after October of 44. She then remarries and moves back to Vermont. The Whites, the Whites, uh, Ellen White gets her first vision in December of 44, begins traveling around, holding meetings, giving testimonies, <laughs> reproving fanaticism, giving messages to people. And at first people don't know what to think of her. And like, they, like the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. They, they examine her carefully. And those who do finally accept her, they said, we're convicted. This matches the, the test of a prophet. This is, these are messages from heaven. But some people didn't like the reproofs. And rather than accepting the proofs and humbling themselves and repenting, they started bad-mouthing the messenger. Okay? And Rachel is in Vermont. She's never had a chance to meet her, see Ellen White in vision, as, as many of these people did. They would actually travel sometimes. They would actually invite Ellen White to visit a place. Perchance she might have a vision there, and people could then become convicted as to whether she was a genuine messenger or not. Rachel didn't have that opportunity. And she heard all of this bad-mouthing, all this evil, evil reports. Okay? And she actually gets discouraged, not just about that branch of the Adventist, but about religion in general, apparently, according to this report. She became cold in religion. But Haskell's report continues, his obituary continues, actually. We were happy to learn that after reading testimony number 13, which some unknown friend in kindness had sent them, she and her husband, her mind underwent a decided change. Now consider this. What is testimony 13? Ellen White was having visions and get receiving messages from the beginning of her ministry, right? And she was told, write it down. And so they were publishing these little booklets. And it was testimony number one, testimony number two. And if you look at the footnote, um, number three, volume one that we have of Testimonies for the Church contain testimonies one through 14. They put them all 14 together, and that's volume one of the Testimonies for the Church. So that's the way it worked. I'm actually working on a file. I haven't finished it. Analyzing the sequence of those testimonies and the dates in which each one of them came and a little bit about the information and how they've ended up in volumes one through nine of Testimonies for the Church. Maybe sometime we can go through that. But that was what she, someone gave her this little one collection called uh, Testimony Number 13. And if you look at the information, I gave you a reference there for it. First of all, in the Testimonies, page 630, paragraph 1, Ellen White references Testimony Number 13. It was published after October 21, 1867. When did she die? February of 68. She, this is published a few months before Rachel dies. Someone in kindness, unknown to Haskell, sends a copy to the Prestons. And she reads it, and what happens? He says, her mind underwent a decided change. Her heart was made to rejoice a short time before her death, in hearing of the result of the Washington meeting, so meetings back there in Washington, New Hampshire, at the recent visit of Brother and Sister White. I tried to track down that visit, and I couldn't figure out exactly, uh, or, or I couldn't find a report on that one. Um, she expressed her willingness to die, and expressions like the following were among her last. 
Jesus is good. Jesus is my friend. Now, the next item here that I note was that actually five years before she died, she became an invalid. In fact, the obituary says at the beginning of it, I, I did find that and I printed it off. She has been helpless for five years. So she was an invalid for five years before her death. And you can see that probably would also discourage her. But she had a change of heart and change of mind and became positive just before the end and saw again uh, that Jesus was good and was her friend. In February the 1st of 1868, at the age, fairly young age, we could say, of 59, she dies. 1868. So, what, what did God use Rachel Oaks Preston to bless, yes, to bring the Sabbath tree. And what I thought I would do was show you the sequence of how this line of Sabbath truth came. See, Rachel is in the first column there in this next table, and she passes it on to Frederick Wheeler, and it, without a doubt to William Farnsworth as well. Wheeler accepts it in 40, uh, March of 44, Farnsworth in January of 45. And Wheeler, obviously, he's preaching about it before Farnsworth accepts it. So Farnsworth probably is, is also influencing. I mean, Wheeler is influencing Farnsworth to accept it. Do you see what I'm trying to say there? In turn, Wheeler passes the truth on to a man by the name of T.M. Preble. Again, we don't have an issue of lest we forget, on Preble. But here's a picture of him. I think we talked about him before, didn't we? This man with the big, long beard. <laughs> I think we mentioned him before when we were talking about the Sabbath and, and Joseph Bates. Because Bates, as we see here in the table, Bates is influenced by Preble. Again, just to review, Preble was a free will Baptist minister from New Hampshire. And he was disfellowshipped from his church when he accepted William Miller's preaching. He accepted the Sabbath and later, later published his views. And as our table says here, he accepted the Sabbath in August of 44, which was even before Farnsworth did, right? But he got him from Frederick Wheeler, and he wrote in February of 45, the month after Farnsworth accepted the Sabbath, he wrote something called the Hope of Israel. And it's the Hope of Israel publication that influenced Joseph Bates in 45 to accept the Seventh-day Sabbath. But not only Joseph Bates, we have a new name to add that we haven't even considered before, that I recall. The same article, Hope of Israel, influenced a young man by the name of J.N. Andrews the same year, 45, to accept the Sabbath. Who did Bates influence in turn? James and Ellen White visited Bates in Massachusetts and they found out that he was believing in the Seventh-day Sabbath. And at first they didn't see any light in it. But Ellen White had a vision very shortly after that. Not only that, Bates went over to New York. Remember when we were talking about this man here? This man had a conference on his farm, on the sanctuary, remember? And Bates came over to listen to the sanctuary message. And there, Bates gave Edson the Sabbath truth, and Edson gave Bates the sanctuary truth. There's, that's the cross connections that we had. In, in it's, this. it's a sort of a pollination. Yes. <laughs> the pollen is being spread yeah. and fertilizing. Different flowers. And I thought, I thought I would throw this in. Again, a name we haven't looked at yet. This is later on. This is a real young fellow, uh, a bit younger than Andrews even. Andrews in 1852, September, passes the Sabbath truth on to J.N. Loughborough, who was a first-day Adventist minister at the time. Young fellow, he was only 20 years old because he was born in 32. Okay? Isn't that amazing? We can track these events through um, uh, person to person passing on the truth of the Sabbath. And again, these people were not accepting it just by, oh yeah, you, you, you believe the Sabbath? I'll accept that too. They studied it. They reviewed the evidences. They pondered it. They prayed about it. Would you like to know what Preble put in that pamphlet article, The Hope of Israel? Here's a, here's a sample of it. Okay. Wishing for the truth on all subjects connected with Christ's coming, I would present a few thoughts on the Sabbath. That's how he starts it out. 
So he's actually connecting the Sabbath with Christ's coming. Because he's wanting the truth on all subjects connected with Christ's coming. Why do you think they connected the Sabbath with Christ's coming? Pardon? Millennium. Millennium is one of the things. Um, they actually believed that we needed to recover truth before Christ came. Okay. And he actually quotes William Miller on the Sabbath. This is amazing. Miller, did you know Miller wrote on the Sabbath? Here's, this is Miller's words. It's be, this is talking about the fourth commandment. It's being contained in the Ten Commands, written by the finger of God on both tables of the testimony, graven on stone, to be assigned forever, and a perpetual covenant proves, in my opinion, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that it is as binding upon the Christian church as upon the Jewish, and in the same manner, and for the same reasons. Did you know that Miller said that? He said that. But then he turned around and repudiated the keeping of the seventh day as the fulfillment of that commandment. And he does it for two reasons. Christ's resurrection and meeting with his disciples on the first day. And the phrase, the rest remaining, the, the, the remains of Sabbath day for, the, for God's people, in Hebrews chapter 4. He said, Miller, that that rest remaining points to the saints' rest after their resurrection. Okay, after the resurrection. And Preble quotes all of this, and he says, I agree with Brother Miller on everything but the last sentence, <laughs> mm -hmm. which was where Miller said it does not apply to the seventh day. And here's, Miller's, here's Preble's response to Miller. The sentiments <clears throat> expressed in the above extract I believe to be true except the closing part where it is said, the Sabbath which remains is to be kept on the first day of the, every week as a perpetual sign, etc., now I ask, how can this be? If we keep the first day as a sign, I do not see how we can have our thousand years rest in the new earth. Tell the 8,000 years. As the first day would be the eighth, reckoning in succession order from creation. Make sense? What comes after the seventh? The next day is the first day, but it's the eighth of, of the things. But we all as Advent believers have and do still expect our rest in the seventh thousand years. Therefore, I think we should keep the seventh day as a sign, <clears throat> according to the commandment. Uh, you may have never heard it applied in this way, but they, they, they were focused fairly strongly on the, on the seventh thousand being the seventh you know, millennium and, and, and a thousand years as, as, as a day. Some day in that respect. Struck me a few seconds back. The idea that they believe now this may have mm -hmm. initiated a lot more of this study than would have otherwise a stricture of doctrine mm -hmm. than would otherwise have been done. If they believe that they had to come to a fullness of the truth, mm -hmm. that's fine. Mm -hmm. And we ought to think very hard about whether or not mm -hmm. we've got everything. A comment is about the fullness of the truth. Do we, do we have all the truth that we have, even now? And I think the evidence is that there's more light to shine on our path. Um, frequently, long after the Seventh-day Adventist Church was established, Ellen White talked about more light. And particularly at the Minneapolis era, because the people ask her, is this more light? And yes, yes, this is more light. Um, therefore, I think... Preble wrote, we should keep the seventh day as a sign according to the commandment. I know the reasons which are given in favor of keeping the first day, and they once satisfied me, but fail to do it now, after a thorough examination of the subject. It's God's word or human logic. Okay, God's word or human logic or tradition. Okay, watch what he does. And he says, a, now, a word now in relation to the history. As far as I've been able to examine in, during the last six months, he's been working on this for six months, and he's examining what? Examining history. And how many books are available? Probably just what's in the libraries of his day, wherever he happened to be in, in, in the cities. But what, he, what was he able to find in the, in the last six months? Since I became convicted on this point, I have found the following to be true. 
The disciples evidently kept the first day of the week as a festival in commemoration of the resurrection of Christ, but never as the Sabbath. A controversy, however, commenced toward the close of the first century to see whether both days would be kept or only one. And if one should be kept, which one, the first day or the seventh? This controversy increased century after century till A.D. 603, when Pope Gregory passed a law establish, abolishing the seventh-day Sabbath and establishing the first day. So that's what he was able to find in his searching the six months. He also, and I didn't have time, room to put it on here, he also, again, these, this material is on the CD-ROM. TM Preble is his abbreviations there. I'll give you the references here on these paragraphs so you could find this um, on, on, uh, on that uh, collection of his there. I think this is the only thing we have by Preble on, on the CD-ROM. He references Eusebius, John Calvin, and other historical sources on the fact that the Sabbath was changed. It was not kept by the apostles. It actually was changed later. And his conclusion Thus we see Daniel 7.25 fulfilled, the little horn changing times and laws. Therefore it appears to me that all who keep the first day of the week for the Sabbath are Pope's Sunday keepers and God's Sabbath breakers. Yes. <laughs> so, again, this man who took it up from Frederick Wheeler he ran with it. He wrote, wrote a thing on it that actually impacted other people in a major way, Andrews and Bates. And then he says in the next paragraph, Truth is what I'm after, and if I had but one day on this earth to spend, I would give up error for truth as soon as I could see it. May the Lord give us wisdom and help us to keep all his commandments that we may have right to the tree of life. Revelation 22. Verse 14. That's his testimony. Very, very interesting. Um, but we recall from our previous thing that he did not continue to run with it. And that's made clear in the next statement because I thought it would be useful to give you an extract from James White's autobiographical information recounting the same sequence of events here with Rachel, Preston, and Preble. Uh, in his book, Life Incidents, published in 1868, page 268, this is, this, is, this is on the back of the handout. Yeah. As early as 1844, Sister Preston, a Seventh-day Baptist who was a believer in the soon coming of Christ, introduced the Sabbath to the Adventist of Washington, New Hampshire, and made a good impression. With the help, that's a, that's a compliment, right? This woman made a good impression on this. With the help of the publications with of that, her people. With that blunt <laughs> yeah. With the help of the publications of her people. Now, what does he mean by that? I, I believe that she had some literature from the Seventh-day Baptists. It's not just giving stuff uh, just saying stuff to Frederick Wheeler. She had some literature as well. With the help of the publication of her people and the blessing of God, about 40 embraced the Sabbath. Wasn't just Wheeler in, in, in Farnsworth. 40. Okay? And obviously, it probably is over a period of time. The truth on this subject reached other points in New Hampshire. About the, that time, Elder T. M. Preble embraced the Sabbath and began to teach it. He called the attention of Adventists to the question by a pamphlet on the subject dated February 13, 1845. That's what we just quoted from, the Hope of Israel. After showing the claims of the Bible Sabbath and the fact that it was changed to Sunday by the papacy, he said, and there's the quote again, Thus we see Daniel 7.25 fulfilled, the little horn changing times and laws. Therefore it appears to me that all who keep the first day for the Sabbath are the Pope's Sunday keepers and God's Sabbath breakers. But, Elder Preble, not seeing the Sabbath reform under the message of the third angel, see what he failed to, say, failed to see? He failed to see that the third angel of Revelation 14, in talking about and warning about false worship, right? 
If any man worship the beast in his image, he's going to receive what? The, the mark, right? And he's going to come under come under God's judgment. Of worship is how in vain do they worship me, keeping for commandments the, the, tra the traditions of men, you know, the doctrines of men. That's Jesus. Uh, That's Jesus. Comment on false worship, right. on false worship, counterfeit worship. So he didn't see that vital connection in the third angel's message, Revelation 14. Brother Pebble not seeing the Sabbath reform under the message of the third angel, and that. In the ripening of the harvest of the earth, the Sabbath was to be a test. Continued his ministerial labors in connection with those who bitterly opposed it. He soon lost interest, lost his interest in the subject, and has since become one of its bitterest opponents, opposers. The same is true of Elder J.B. Cook and a few other Advent ministers, who at a later point of time embraced the Sabbath, and abandoned it. Elder Preble had, however, called the attention of Adventists to this subject, and in different parts of New England, several in different parts of New England, embraced the Sabbath, whose interest in it did not prove as transient as his had been. So again, people pick up the message, pass it on, and maybe then drop it, pull back. But the message goes on, right? The message continues from person to person, and some hang on to it to the end. Hang on to it to the end, and it's clear. Regardless of what we do with it, truth stands. Right, truth stands. And we have the benefit of, again, this thread of Sabbath truth, starting with this lady, Rachel Preston, who was willing to speak up to the pastor and um, call him to accountability. Yes, Colin. What's interesting is in this time period, mm -hmm. the Seventh-day Baptists began to feel like that they had not been holding the Sabbath forward like they should. And they had a conference and determined to renew their uh, wickedness. And so that's probably how Rachel got You're right. this literature. <clears throat> let, me, let me reference that. It's in less, this Lest We Forget on her. And this it's a brief, it's a column called the Brief Sabbath a History of Sabbath Keeping. It starts with Martin Luther, and it ends in 1843. And this is the 1843 thing that, that Colleen just mentioned. The General Conference of Seventh Day Baptists meet in 1843, the year before Rachel persuades Frederick Wheeler. They make a resolution at their general conference to set apart November 1, 1843, as a day for fasting and prayer so that God would arise and plead for his holy Sabbath. They did not anticipate the manner nor magnitude of the answer God had been preparing for this prayer. And Rachel Oaks moves to Washington, New Hampshire, and the rest is history, as we say. But again... Um, the Lord's Providence. Lord's Providence. The comment about Martin Luther? Um, Martin Luther sent theologians to dissuade Oswald Glatt and Andreas Fisher from keeping the Bible Sabbath. Martin Luther was like William Miller. God used in an amazing way. But the advanced truth, he opposed. Okay? That's, that's what happened. There were Sabbath keepers. 1520, that was the 1520s, 1529, one of the men that he, he sent theologians to dissuade from keeping the Sabbath, Andreas Fletcher, Fisher and his wife were captured and sentenced to death. She by drowning, which was carried out, and he by hanging. He escaped, however, until 1540 when he was caught and hurled from a castle wall. So those that, that accepted the Sabbath in the old country, in the old times, were not dealt with as nicely Again, picture what's happening here. God has established a nation of freedom, freedom of conscience, freedom, liber liberty of conscience, religious liberty, where this thing could come and it would not be stamped out by the heavy hand of persecution. And it could, be, it could foster and spread and spread and spread. This is what God established this country for. It's a cradle for the Advent message 
and the landmark truths from the Bible that needed to be recaptured and build a critical mass, as we say, and then could be spread to the world. Not only a place of freedom, but a place of prosperity that would have the financial resources to send people to all the world. And it's been delayed, but God is still doing that, is he not? He's doing that. So picture what's happening. I mean, it goes on through. 1600s, the Trask, uh, uh, James, Bamfield, Mumford, 1700s, the Moravians, Zinzendorf, uh, and then the 1800s, the uh, Seventh-day Baptists organized their first general conference, 1802. 1,200 members. Not very energetic about evangelism, but they had that day of fasting and prayer in 1843. And God hears their prayers in a way that perhaps they don't perceive. And um, there are still Seventh-day Baptists. Many, many people who get disaffected with the sa sanctuary message in Adventism and Ellen White, that's where they end up. Seventh-day Baptists. I have a friend that I could name. He's a Seventh-day Baptist minister now. Uh, just met him the other day <clears throat> after years. And uh, I uh, will be praying for him. Um, anyway, the Sabbath truth. We're just being introduced to it a little bit here in a, in a big way. We saw it earlier under the stories of Bates and Farnsworth, but this is really, we're getting majorly introduced to it here with the story of Rachel Preston. Thank God for ladies who know how to speak up in church. 